Today, you will hear a special edition of the Powerful Ladies podcast. This is a live, unedited recording from our roundtable, a powerful conversation about America. Racism two years later. Has anything changed? This episode took place on June 10th, 2022, and was planned and promised two years ago when we had our first edition of a powerful conversation about America following the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Two years have gone by in a flash, and it was time to check in and ask, has racism in America changed? Has legislature, law, or statistics changed since then? How is racism or progress showing up, evolving, or hiding in plain sight? Our panelists include the amazing Rhonda Brunson, Chandra Gore, and Lauren Wilson, powerful and successful women who have been part of our previous episodes on racism in America. We encourage and invite you to share this episode with everyone who needs to hear it. This conversation matters for our democracy and our future. If I got to choose who I hang out with on a Friday afternoon, it's going to be you ladies, because you are powerful and up to big things and you show up with big smiles and you're not afraid to have conversations about all the stuff a ton of people are avoiding talking about, which is why we're here today. Uh, so for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Kara Duffy. I'm a entrepreneur and business coach and creator and host of Powerful Ladies. Um, and I have amazing panelists here with me today who uh, have all been guests on the podcast individually, have all been guests previously as panelists on our special series, A Powerful Conversation About America. Um, and those topics have ranged, you know, we focus on racism and women in the workplace. Um, but we're coming back because it's been two years since the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and since a lot of things have shifted in this country from an awareness perspective, if nothing else. And we committed way back then that we were not going to let this conversation stop happening because it's so easy for it to come and go and not be something mm-hmm. that is on people's radars. So without further ado, I'm going to let my panelists introduce themselves and we'll start with Chandra. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chandra Gore. I am the principal consultant and um the founder of Chandra Gore Consulting. I'm also the host and writer at Conversations with Chan. I'm excited to be here because so much has transpired in two years and we definitely need to talk about it and be straight about exactly what's going on. So I, I'm so glad to join you ladies today. Yes, thank you. And then Rhonda. My name is Rhonda, but they call me the Credit Queen. And for the last 18 years, I've been preaching and teaching the Credit Gospel to all who will listen. I'm excited to be here. I have a lot of uh, information and experience when it comes to uh, racism and lending and redlining. So I'm here for the whole conversation. Thank you, camera girl. Thank you. (laughs) Welcome. And Lauren. Everyone. And thanks, Kara, for for having us back at like, I'm like, racing through my mind of everything that's happened in the past two years or, or hasn't happened or lack thereof. So I'm really excited that you are having this conversation. Um, for those that don't know me, my name's Lauren. Um, I run a luxury e-commerce resale uh, site called Dora Mar. We're based in New York City. Um, so a lot of my past two years has really been about, um, you know, having, having equity and building a company and, and building that generational wealth and what those what's been happening over the past two years and how that's kind of shifted or not shifted the landscape. So really excited to dive into those, to those topics today. Well, I'm so glad to have you here. Um, a lot has, and as Lauren said, hasn't happened in two years. Um, so I just want to know, like, first question is, do you guys feel like anything has moved forward in the direction that it should? <laughs> And I appreciate the skeptical immediate look from Chandra. So Chandra, go ahead. I know you're bursting at the seams. Go for it. (laughs) So I will say this. I feel that a lot of placation has happened and a lot of performatory um, things have happened that haven't made any real change. Then we have people being gunned down and murdered just while they're shopping. And the media, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just... 
it blows my mind at the amount of, oh, you know, that's a one-off or, oh, that doesn't, I mean, it's exhausting, but I've seen it personally in, um, in business, in, in, in business. Like I've had been approached by different companies to sit on their, like to sit, to, to partner with their companies, but not give anything, not to make, not have a voice. So mm-hmm. it's like, let's go ahead and get rid of the monotone, um, you know, the, the what we have and add some color and make it look like we are being inclusive. But we want you here, but we don't want you to say anything. So I feel like that has been the the ongoing theme of since for the past two years is we will allow you to come to the table, but you have to sit at the kitty table and shut up. And or just look I, like a beautiful Benetton ad. Thank you. That's mm-hmm. it. Yes. In, in the background, you, you, or, or, you know, you can stand out. It's, it's just, <laughs> it's draining. Mm-hmm. So that, that's what I have to say. I'm sorry. My faith says exactly what I, what I think sometimes. So, <laughs> so with the placation, John, are you referring to like the red velvet cake, ice cream and the, um, all of these things that the stores are doing to try to play. Oh. Let me tell you something. I do my friends for being too hard. It's, I feel like they're trying and missing the mark. You know what I mean? But they are trying. Now they could use a uh, better direction, of course, way better yeah. uh, guidance on the back end. But I do applaud them for at least trying to make Juneteenth an official holiday mm-hmm. um, in stores and stuff so that it's represented. I think that their execution is poor. If you look at the makeups of these comms and marketing departments, there's nobody there <laughs> that can say, uh uh-uh, uh, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Right. Yeah, I, I was going to say the biggest change I've seen is in uh, marketing campaigns. Let's say that, right? Like, especially looking at luxury fashion, like, there is this, this there is just such a performative aspect. Like, I remember back in June 2020, everyone was releasing, you know, how many Black people were in executive level roles or the board members. Like, where's that gone? Um, you know, I haven't seen that makeup of any of those boards over the past two years. Um, and I, and I say that just because the past couple of years I've been raising, you know, looking to raise venture capital and capital from outside sources and women get 2% of venture capital and women of color get like 0.6% of venture capital. It's, it's absolutely insane. Um, and I think that I get a ton of meetings, right. But I think when push comes to shove, you know, the makeup of VC and investors that have the money to invest in are, are just older white men. And, as much as they performatively like need to change and have their portfolio be people of color, it's just this inherent bias that still cannot shift. Um, and and it, it's going to take more than a cute marketing campaign to to shift that. Or you know panels or discussions, which are all great and helpful, but um, I can't think we can say in the past two years that there's been like a real shift in like you know black founders receiving more capital or you know, women of color receiving more capital. And that really is what shifts a lot of the equity, right? So, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's people trying and taking a conversation, which is better than I guess what it had been. Um, but is it really moving the needle yet? No. So there's, you know, so many topics in the news right now that I would argue the majority of Americans are so over it being a conversation. They're not being a solution. It's not just being fixed. You know, um, Matthew McConaughey said in, when he was on in Washington the other day, like, we are not as divided as you're making us think we are. And I don't know if that's true or not. Everyone I talk to seems to be hanging out in a very similar space. And what's making me crazy is whether we're talking about Roe v. Wade or gun violence or police brutality, you name it, everyone keeps trying to make it not a racially motivated conversation. And I, it's, I feel like I'm hitting my head against the wall being like, how can you say Roe v. Wade is not a racially motivated conversation? How can you say gun violence isn't? Like, is that, you know, being the privileged white girl, is that me being naive or silly or it's making me crazy that they're not seeing that there's a red line going through all of this that no one seems to want to talk about collectively. It, the whole, the Roe versus Wade situation, like, that is, I, 
I'm trying to get the words so I can articulate this in a, in a way that is professional as possible. But it's targeted towards lower class individuals, brown people who are in areas where, you know, you have to, they're already struggling. And yes, you know, it, it, um, people, you know what I'm saying? As families, like sometimes it's a family and, you know, you, 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 it's penalizing them for living their lives, but also it's keeping them from making decisions that will help them to grow. Like you may not want a baby now, but you may want a baby later because you're mm-hmm. working four jobs just to maintain and which, what, what they're supposed to stop sleeping with their husband. I mean, I just, I just need some, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then if you have, and then you look at the access to, um, to protection or the access to health care, a lot of times there's no no real doctors that can they can get to have access to that can help them the family plan that can help them to guide them on um on how to better you know take care of their health because they have to choose between going to work or going to the doctor. Mm-hmm. And then if they can't get access to reproductive care, they're gonna take the 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 way out and it somebody's gonna die and the family's gonna lose their breadwinner. So it's like it's a it's a it's easier said than done like oh just protect yourself okay but they don't have access to the what you know to talk about that like they may have mm-hmm. issues they may have other things that need support with but they don't have access to that support so it's definitely targeting it's definitely the biggest people who are the biggest section that are going to be affected are the the lower you know the black mm-hmm. and brown people let's just be be honest because if you have someone who's an upper middle class caucasian family they can drive an hour. They can fly to different places to get the care that they need and be able to get these things because they can afford it. Even if they're not um, affluent or whatever, they still have the resources or they can call in these resources. And so that's, it's like, um, it's penalizing people for being born a certain color or born a certain way and then not providing them with the health care. Because I just feel like, you know, certain neighborhoods, they don't even have fresh food. They don't have groceries. Like it's it, all a ripple effect. It's like food deserts, and mm-hmm. you expect people to not live their lives. Like, what what do you want them to do? And I just pose a different question. So, so we we do this. We, we go the government's way. Who is going to raise these babies? Now, if yeah. these babies end up in foster care, we know it's more brown kids in foster care than any other race. A lot of uh, people who are not minorities are not willing to take minority children so now what happens to them i mean i don't mm-hmm. i just don't understand what the end game is you want me to have a baby i'm telling you i am not in a position to raise it who is right. going to raise it and then you have more abused children one of my friends is a foster parent and he got an emergency placement of a little boy um his he was displaced because his grandmother was a- abusing his sister uh she was not allowed she didn't give her a room she has no bed she has no food she treated him like a king but her, her she treated like trash when people have these um, venomous um, ideas of what this kid is, if they don't like it, they abuse it. And now we have a whole nother issue on our hands. So I don't, mm-hmm. I just cannot, I can't clearly understand the end game. What do you want me to do with this baby? <laughs> yeah. And, and then when you ask for help, like some of the kids that are in foster care, and this is, this is the ripple effect. They age out at 18. Mm-hmm. They are left with no support. So my question is this. So um, you're creating a cycle of individuals that go into homelessness. They go into desperate situations. So you're trying to say for 18 years, oh, you know, we're supposed to look the other way. Oh, now you're a plague on the government. You're a, you know, and I'm like, well, damn, did we try to fix this like before, <laughs> before yep. we got this far? Like, exactly. it's, can you guys hear? Can you guys hear me? I don't know if I'm frozen or not because I look frozen. Oh, can you hear me? You, you're frozen, but I can hear you. <laughs> and then, um, it's men who are making these decisions. The people who don't even have a uterus. I just make that make sense. I just well, yeah. yeah, I think it's interesting that you say that. I'm helping a Ukrainian family with six children. So there's two parents, six kids, eight adults. They came from the Ukraine early April, and they're just like finding services is crazy. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think I was gonna. Homeless. I was and gonna. I was gonna got them here, but now there's nothing. You know, they're not supporting them when they're here, which was really eye opening for me. Totally, and that's why I think you know you talk about the Roe v. Wade and then um, gun violence. Like you force someone to have this child, and now like there is zero protection. Not even protection exactly. in terms of like 
you yeah. know, making sure they're food secure or, um, you know, I mean, education, yes. you know, that and, sort of thing. It's, it's like literally being gunned down, right? Like where's the protection yeah. once these, once these children are born. And again, like, it's not, it's not qualitative. It's like literally data of that. This affects lower mm-hmm. income, black and brown people. Like this isn't something that we're just like qualitatively saying it's in the data. Um, right. and so, I mean, it's, there's so many ways you can talk about just how rife with issues this, this is right now. Well, and, and to leading into the, the redlining and the access to loans and other resources, it's just another example, as you were saying, Chandra, of preventing a family from leaving wherever space they are that they want to move on from. Like not we are con- no, good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not even just not, not leaving. We can't even sell. I'm sure you all saw that article and uh, the interview on uh, CNBC where the couple was trying to sell their house when they uh, represented themselves as black people. They got offered 10 times less when they represented their house as white people. They got 10 times more with the appraisal. So I can't even get fair market value. I was looking at um, doing a HELOC and mm-hmm. I went next door and asked my neighbor, would you mind coming over? I'm going to take all my artwork work down because, and she got so sad. She said, what are you talking about? She never saw the article. I said, no, this is a real thing. When uh, a person of a minor, uh, you know, brown person is trying to sell mm-hmm. something, it will give you far less. And actually I'm in the market for a new car. I'm thinking of letting my neighbor take the car because I'm getting local. I know it's not we're in the market right now where everyone wants to buy a used car. They don't have any cars for sale. They're offering me $7,000 less. I bought the car in November. You know what I mean? So it's all of that plays into the back end. They look at you. They uh, mm-hmm. sum you up. I got braids this week. Who knows? If I would have had my hair out and a bob and walked in with some real clothes on, they might have treated me different. But uh, the nation that we live in does um, sum you up. They summarize you in 20 seconds by how you look. And if you don't mm-hmm. look the part, if you don't speak the part, especially a brown person in finance trying to tell you what to do with your money, they don't listen. It does you, you automatically lose your credibility. And <laughs> that's been the biggest thing because I saw this thread on Twitter where this young lady gave her white friend her sales and data and everything. And she got, you know, $15,000 or twenty five thousand, some astronomical number in funding for her business. And when the when she went to go get funding for her business, they gave her seven thousand dollars. I think it was seven thousand dollars, some number that wouldn't even help her bottom line. But the person who had no business experience, no no, no knowledge of anything, but used her numbers, used her like it, it, listen. If people don't understand, Girl, like this is a real I, thing. Like I like, could go off know? on this for hours. <laughs> this is my. I literally have a business that is at a million dollar run rate and I cannot get funding the same way a white dude with a baseball cap that went to Stanford can get $3 million and have not one customer, not Not one sale. Like Mm -hmm. it is absolutely mind boggling. And it's not just me because I just did an event with these um, three women of color who started this Mezcal brand. And they're like, it's absolutely ridiculous. And then you end up there are a lot of funds who are like trying to represent like underrepresented founders or women of color, but then you end up putting, there's so few of them. And then they end up having a lot of pressure on them because like, they don't have to just like your business, right? Because you're both black women, but like, there's so few of them. That there's so much pressure on those to make the change because like the white guys aren't doing it. They're not making the change. So ugh, it's just, it's a really, really vicious, vicious cycle. And it, those, when they open up, like Cosmo has this thing, right? You know how many black and black women are applying for this? So it's like it's like you know they it it becomes they only are picking 10, 10 businesses, yeah. 10 black black women on businesses. 10 out of how many like how do you mm. narrow it down like it's like a um it becomes a hunger game pretty much. <laughs> like, who's going to get the funding? And it's like yo like it should not be this hard. It should not be you know they we don't, they only have a certain amount of funds and they can they yeah. can't allocate it to everyone but it, it just it blows it just that's why I don't really seek funding I actually um am bootstrapping it on my own because if I didn't have credit lines like I do have like thank you Rhonda for the tips on credit um I do for, I do pay attention <laughs> I'm able to use that as a um and that's the thing we have to we get seek our resources from inside of our circle to sustain our businesses. And I want to be able to walk into um, 
into a bank with my sandals on and a little t-shirt and some jean shorts and come out with a couple million. No, I'll be set outside the bank. That's what these Last. guys do though. Like truly, I'm not like, I'm really it. not kidding. I've like it's, 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 I mean, I feel like it's a sore spot for me just because it is, has been my life for the past few years. And now Chandra, it, it really is like looking inside more of like my network and my circle on how to, how to build it and how to fund it because it's a freaking good business and I'm not going to sit here and wait for some, you know, white nope. guy to believe in me. No. Nope. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. I'm just No, I mean, uh, so you yeah. sometimes have to, because like, I it's pretty wild. It's stressful. There was a, a book I read one time. It was called Old Money. An old money book talked about what you basically described. Coming in places, um, t-shirt, khakis, sandals, and it works. For them, it yes. does not work for me. So even when it comes to um, interviews or, or one of my uh, last business cards, I had braids. That was a big deal. I was afraid to have braids on my um, on my business mm -hmm. card because I didn't want to be prejudged. Um, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, when it comes to lending, uh, they know who you are before you even walk in the door. The way the algorithms are set up, how uh, Facebook software, that metaverse is connected to everything. They know exactly who you are. They know who your friends are. And they make decisions uh, based on that. I wonder, I think that there should be a study on how many brown uh, people are forced to file bankruptcy as a result of starting a business. I filed bankruptcy as a result of starting a business. You carry all the load on your own. The first business loan I got was as a result of COVID. I'd have been in business already for 12 years. So but no one had ever mm -hmm. offered me anything. And I never asked because I was already under the impression I was good. not good enough. And then um, also the way that minorities form businesses is different. So when we start, we start with our, our heart. We build businesses in our heart and we design them that way. We don't build businesses outside of ourselves. We're not necessarily thinking, okay, I got to hire this person. We're really planning to go to work every day. And then yeah. uh, you get there, you're making money. You're like, okay, I got this. I'm going to hold it. You know, you want to finance something and you don't have a paper trail. You know why? Because you built it with your heart and not with your brain or your accountant. So you have to go back, do all those things. You find out later you've made over 100000 your deductions are low. Now you owe the government 80000 You know what I mean? So it's such a cycle. Even when you watch how, um, who's the Amazon guy? Uh, Bezos. Jeff Bezos, yeah. He don't pay no taxes. Why am I paying taxes? Why are you at the small businesses? <laughs> Leave us alone, which we're doing our best. But the, the bigger the corporation, the less they pay. Us little guys trying to make it in the pond, just take everything. Just take it. <laughs> This is go ahead and just send the invoices to take your payments yes. and send it right to the IRS. Yeah. And this is the thing, like I have a client who, um, she's a, a, a accountant, but she's also studying the tax code and studying to be a tax accountant because her biggest thing is supporting other Black businesses to understand how to navigate using your tax, those tax benefits, those tax codes to benefit their business so they don't file for bankruptcy. So they're not using their personal capital to fund their business. And I will say it's a mind blowing the number of people that she's actually went through, went back on their taxes. And when I hear her talk about it, I was like, I could have been one of those people. Like it is one of those things, like you end up owing $70,000. Like you said, $80,000. Listen, I'm listen. Y'all just going to find me. Mm -hmm. I don't got it. I well, there's stuff out here. There's a book I'm reading right now called Proximity, and it's talking about how who you know and who you have to talk to to get what you need is like so important. And on a very simple level, like I, my parents just moved to North Carolina and they're redoing their like estate plan and will and their investments. And I said, they're like, oh, we're talking to someone. We're doing this and this. I go, stop. I'm like, I want you to talk to somebody who works with people here in Orange County because they're playing a different game. Ooh, and this so. is still, you know, white family to white family. I'm like, no, like you don't know all the information. I know you don't because you're not using things that there's not a keyword that popped up in this conversation where I'm like, yes, you're on the right track. And it's, it's crazy to me how um, it's also why I do what I do. Like there are people who just, there are simple things that, that are in our, in everyone's way that don't have to be. And it absolutely is happening more uh, for people of color. It is absolutely happening more for women. And it's like, there's a secret code of like how you can optimize living in the U S and making it all happen. 
that no one wants to be talking about. There's a couple people I follow on YouTube who are sharing, you have people like Rhonda who are sharing, like there's secret, there are people who are willing to tell you what to, to do and not do and look for. But it is, um, it, it's just, I do not understand why we make it so hard for everyone to chase the American dream if that's what we say that this country is about. Well, can I just say this? I don't know that conversations, conversations, of course, about racism are never going to stop. However, I do think we're in uh, in store for a major pivot. I don't think the big thing is going to be black and white. I think the big mm-hmm. thing is going to be rich or poor. With the way that the economy is shifting, um, yeah. I happened to move into a neighborhood last year. I bought a house. It was $350,000. My white neighbors have been so nice to me. I mean, I was I was actually afraid because when I first moved to Miami, I experienced extreme racism. So uh, living here in Fort Lauderdale, these people have been amazing. I've, I've, I've named the people across the street, my dog's grandparents. They're so sweet to me. Um, but they still have old values. The majority of the neighborhood, 100% of the neighborhood is all homeowners. Most of them have been here for over 40 years. And so they've seen their property values go up. My house, I bought for $350. It's now worth $550 in a year, right? Mm-hmm. So um, if we continue to go, if gas prices continue to go, if food prices continue to go, we are creating an income divide that is going to be more static than yeah. racism. And our, now how we are going to be looking at people, even our own complexion is going to change. Crime will change, accessibility mm-hmm. change. Uh, well, as Chandra was saying, with even the medical, the, the, the um, hospitals in the area, all of those things will continue to change and I mm-hmm. think that will be more of a conversation moving forward, not just racism, but now we're going to have huge inequality in uh, income and ec- economics. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, um, you know, Lauren, how have you seen that discrepancy between like the haves and the have nots shifting in New York City? And how have you seen it impact your business being in a luxury space? Yeah, I mean, I think like from the city perspective, just from COVID and also, um, you know, all the BLM movements in summer 2020, um, like I'll be honest, there is a shift in the atmosphere in New York and it's not the same. I don't know if it just has to do with the sparseness of there's just not as many people here anymore, um, but something, it, 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 it's not feeling settled at all. I think people are very much on ed, edge, whether it be kind of what Rhonda was saying about, you know, this this looming kind of recession and economic change where, you know, the inflation and um, I really, I do agree with her. There really is this ginormous shift between the rich and the poor and the have and the have nots. I mean, right now, guys, in New York City, like a Brooklyn apartment, a studio, the average price is $6,000 a month. $6,000 for Brooklyn. Like, it is absolutely obscene how expensive this city has become. Um, and it only continues to to rise. Um I mean, look, I don't think I have an answer yet because I think we're in the thick of it right now. And like mm-hmm. as a luxury business, like what does that what does that really mean? And who are we speaking to? And how are we including people? And what is that what is the value of luxury now? Um, I think it's something we wrestle with all the time. And I think it's something I wrestle with as I try to, you know, raise capital as well. Um, like what does that look like? And it doesn't, you know, it's not always um as well received by a lot of the the higher ups that the haves. And I think, you know, you talk about network, right? I think when you're talking about raising capital, whether it be through venture or, you know, bank loans or whatever, it really is all about those warm introductions, right? And being a part of the right networks. How are you a part of the white networks if you weren't part of like the boys club at Princeton, right? So Mm -hmm. um, access to those networks is something that is already guarded. And I like I look, I went to a great school. I went to USC for undergrad and went to NYU for grad school. But these are still like blockaded circles for me that are, you know, very elite, uh, male dominated circles, right? And the the true haves, right? And so, um, you know, it, it becomes quite difficult for a founder like me and a, and a woman like me. I'm, I'm stuck on the $6,000 a month. So what does this property include? Like what, what's Girl. this and how many people can, I, I just, I need what? $6,000. Nothing. You get a studio, you get a toilet and a shower. Um, you probably don't have laundry. Um, you may or may not have a doorman, no roof, no pool. Like you guys, it is so crazy. But what? It is, like, it's I don't like even know leasing. who lives here because I know it's, it's like it's, leasing people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And people apparently buildings are taking like apartments off the market purposely to like skyrocket the available ones. I don't know. There's a lot of, 
lot going on with the rental market. It's it's pretty bad. I, I do. I think there's going to be a lot of shifts in where people live and where they're doing things because, to your point, Rhonda, like those of us who have the luxury of being able to move, like those of us who like mobility is going to become something that we have to look at just for the sake of surviving at this point. And there's so many people who can't, which I think then ties, you know, the entire conversation also into environmental issues. You know, like it, it blows my mind every time you look at where there is a, a dump site or the toxic uh, farm or whatever it is, it's always in a community that no one wants to hear from. They're like, we don't care what you guys have to do with like, and I just, Everything that that is on the hit list of things that people care about, it's their the base impact person is always a low income person of color who's going to deal with it, general generationally or in the short term. Yeah, and so, something on that, like obviously being in 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 fashion sustainability is like a huge conversation in the industry, but you never hear what you hear about and the greenwashing that happens is like. The ocean, the forest, the Amazon, which is all super important, but you never hear about the people it's affecting, actually. Like right now, who are the communities that are struggling the most from these issues, right? Like that's never a part of the sustainability conversation in fashion. It's like, buy a thrifty thing because you're saving the environment. But like, who are you saving? Like, what are you saving? It's never talked about um, because it is lower income families that aren't given, aren't given that, that, that part of the news cycle, essentially. Well, you know, Lauren, it's funny. One of my girlfriends owns um, a resort wear boutique in West Palm. And yeah. so I travel literally like every two weeks. I go to an island somewhere. And so um, I'll go on Fashion Nova, order bathing suits, Matt collection, you know, Diva boutique. She comes in ordering fast fashion, killing the world. I'm like, okay, okay. Because she says, you know, your fashion, you only wear it one time. You, you give it away, whatever. It ends up in the landfill. The kids who are making aren't getting paid enough. She's giving, guess what? I would have never heard that if she wasn't my friend. I never considered yeah. it fashion. I was just like, okay, I can change my clothes real But um, yeah, so it's, it comes with that, the knowledge and the insight. You may not know. People just, we just don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, knowledge is, it, it's power, right? And I think the industry's trying to make a change, but sometimes I think it's, it's, not sometimes always it's so powerful when you put a human face to that like who mm-hmm. who it's actually affecting um and in ways where they you know they can't they can't lead the life they should because they don't have clean water or you know whatever it is yeah yeah i'm i i have three children and this is i'm, I'm going to be personal and i never talk about my children no one i don't post my children but my oldest will be 20 and we have had that conversation and we like most and I'll say most black families do not live in multi-generational homes. They, everyone doesn't stay together. They end up, everybody gets kicked out of the nest. And I think that that is something, a cycle that has to stop. And I'm, I'm, I for one, because I was raised by my granddad. So I didn't have that. I, I didn't, he didn't want me to leave. I left because I wanted to be independent, but I could have still been living with my father right now if he was alive. But my children have this thing and I tell them, I don't care how financially stable you think you are. You will not leave my home. You will not leave <laughs> our home because things outside of we will make it work because like my son is well on, well, he's saving, he's making sure his credit was great. And I say, I don't care how much money you save. I don't care how great your credit is. You can buy a property, but make sure you, you this is, this is home because there's no reason for individuals or, um, or, you know, I've seen so many kids, so many 18, 19 year olds end up homeless because the rule was you're 18, it's midnight, get out of my house. Like mm-hmm. what you just, they're children. I think, I mean, if you're children until they're 25, like let, let's stop that. That is something that I don't mm-hmm. know. It maybe it's just a uh, well, black family thing, but I'm just saying. This. Now I have a client who has a $600,000 pre-approval and wants to buy in Howard County, Maryland. Howard County, Anne Arundel County, uh, Lord Lord County, Lord. they are overpriced. And we're in a market where one of my girlfriends bid on a house that was 425, she offered 501, and she only won the bid by $1,000. So that was $76,000 more than what oh. they asked for. So this client has your mindset. He's my baby, they gotta stay with me. They can't fit in your house. You know what I mean? Like the house that you wanna buy, the 600,000, will only be two or three bedrooms. So now what do you do? You don't want to put them out. 
And guess what? They might got to go. Maybe they should buy their own house. They can live together. But for you to try to find that space at that value right now, it's not normal. It's not It's not mm-hmm. the days of the past. You can find it in other areas, but certain counties, you cannot do it. It doesn't work. Yeah, I'm staying here in Stafford, Virginia. Okay? <laughs> I live in the country. I'm from the country. I'm going to stay here. We're going to buy property back home in South Carolina. Like, see, I know where my dollars can go, okay? Right, I, right. Listen, I, when you said Halbert County, mm, bless mm, it. I was brought to business, but I would never live because that is the most overpriced. You know, Pinky no. County is getting that way too. Well, no, no, no. Every everywhere. It's everywhere. And so the house I was mentioning, mm-hmm. that one was in Owens Mills that she did 76000 over. My little tiny house, this house is only 1,300 square feet. It has a pool, it sits on 7,000 square feet of land, and it's worth $550,000 just because it's 15 minutes from the beach. The house up the street just sold for six forty, fourteen hundred 1,400 square feet. It doesn't matter. Houses are priced mm-hmm. based on location. So you have the right idea of staying in the country. Those prices are not going to go up as fast, but anyone that's trying to be in in the mix, they're going to pay for it. No, I, I, I I was raised to look at that because I did the, I made the mistake. I, I got rid of a condo that I bought in Myrtle Beach when I was 18. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm regretting the decision to sell back then because the mm-hmm. equity in it, like I bought it was $49,000. And now it's um, six months of it, y'all. I don't even want to talk about that. Right. Exactly. The power of real estate. But yeah, I mean, what you're saying makes sense. Most um, across the street from me, my neighbors are Mexican, I believe. So talented. They do everything. You know what I mean? They fix my roof, they mow my lawn, they do everything. But it's about their house is the exact same floor plan as mine. This is only three bedrooms. They don't have a pool. They extended the back of it. They all live together. It's about seven cars at night parked out front. They are happy and they are rich. And I am poor. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's the way that you set your life up. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's something that's not talked about all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, well, it, it, it's there's so much of chasing short term rewards and not mm-hmm. thinking about long term. You know, there's that that other book about being a good um, being a good ancestor, right? How mm-hmm. there there used to be cultures that thought five generations out, a hundred years out, like whatever, like really made choices for how do we keep the legacy going? And there's not a lot of legacy conversations happening. And the people Mm -hmm. who are having them are the ones who have had them this whole time. And so they're fine. Right. So there's like this big breakdown, Uh, but to pivot the conversation a little bit, you know, there, it was announced that the police officer in Grand Rapids is being charged with murder for shooting a black man in the back of the head at a, at a traffic stop. That's and, a right. And it's, it's shocking right now because it's the first time it's happened so quickly. And they just said, yes, that's what it is. It's like not controversial anymore. Like that's how it should be done. How like, is anything changing in the police system? Is anything changing in the justice system that you are aware of or seeing at a, at a local or national level? I'm just going to throw this out there. I'm from Baltimore. Yeah. Excuse me, I'm from Baltimore. I'm from Baltimore. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, that show, We Run the City, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, the stories I've heard about it, and a few of my friends are actually, their characters are featured in the show. Mm-hmm. I think what it did is it opened the eyes up to maybe police are all good. I mean, we already knew. Mm-hmm. This just shows you how this operation went on for so long. It impacted so mm-hmm. many people. One of my girlfriends was telling me that, I think it was my aunt, was mentioning that the police stole the drugs that belonged to the boy and because he could not pay his bill or give the drugs back, he got murdered. Yeah. They set him up all the time. This is this this might be new to people that don't look at me. This is yeah. old news, honey. We've been on that. So yeah. I mean, <laughs> so it's just yeah. what it is. So that's why uh, honestly. Even at young younger ages in our community, if a three if a police car shows up and a kid is three or four, they may automatically start crying. They already have a distrusting they image do. of um, mm-hmm. the police. So I can't say what's happening here because I'm just an implant here. I'm, I'm a nobody. But I do know that um, in Baltimore, there's been a lot of reform to try to warm the community back up to the police and what they should and should not be doing. It's been more accountability there. Um, recently, mm-hmm. uh, one of the rappers got awarded 300000 One of the police officers featured in the yeah. movie got him uh, incarcerated. He went to jail jail. He was found guilty. And all they gave him was 300000 But 
he did get something. So it, it, but it's not mm-hmm. uncommon. He, police have been planting drugs and all that stuff for years. I knew. And that's mm-hmm. the thing, especially here in Stafford. Like now we do have more community outreach. We're seeing them now and more in the community because even though it's a rural area, it's a rural area. So you kind of know like certain families have been here for generations. They maybe have blended, but there's still a divide of, you know, there's the black family over there. You know, when the police come, mm-hmm. they're going to arrest them. Trust and believe they're going to arrest them and they're going to leave y'all alone. And it's, it's that kind of a situation. And it's like, we all like, I, I've had the conversation with my children. I've had, I've seen the conversations that have happened, even in South Carolina. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a known thing. Like you have to watch yourself, make sure you don't travel by yourself. You get pulled over. Everybody in the car, is everybody good? Everybody got ID? Even though you could be sitting in the back seat or the back of a van, they don't have, like, no one else is going to yeah. be looking at everybody else. Everybody has to stay ready. Why? Mm-hmm. Because you don't know what the yeah. temperament is of the officer that's pulling y'all over, and especially if y'all more than three deep, you know, that's a game. So <laughs> you, you, you yeah. can't even yeah. be comfortable in traveling. Like, and it's, it's, it, it's in our mindset. Like when I'm traveling with my children, two of my boys, my youngest son is the tallest. He's six, four, he's 15 years old. He looks, you know, they would classify him as a grown man. I was like, this is a baby, you know, mm-hmm. but I have to watch as he walks around. I was like, listen, you don't, you're not small. You, you, you're six four. You, it, there, there's nothing I can do to change that, but they know the protocol Have mm-hmm. you know, be ready, make sure you don't move it. You just stand still. Even if you stay, you, you're damned if you damn you don't. I'm just saying you can't even stand still because you get shot still. So it's like, I think, yeah. Fast. And I, I think in New York, like uh, the past couple of weeks, I'm sure you guys have been reading about some of the subway shootings that have been happening in New York city. Yep. Um, and the uh, police were not the ones with the one in Brooklyn where no one miraculously died, but shot up a subway car. Um, mm-hmm. And a civilian found him like in front of a bodega that was like three blocks from my apartment. This is back in April. Like a civilian captured him. This guy was charging his phone in McDonald's and then walking around the East Village and a civilian caught him and reported them to the police like two or three days after. And then another person was shot in the subway like point blank. And a civilian like negotiated with the shooter to come out and like give himself up. So there's this there's this idea right now in New York City where there's been a distrust of the of the police because people are obviously seeing what has been happening, um, especially to black men. But now there's this whole like now we have civilians essentially being the ones to protect the citizens that need help at this point. So um, really, there's this idea of, of accountability. And I think, you know, this obviously is uh, like with Uvalde, like what what happened with the police there. Right. Like there's a whole investigation into why. You know, mm-hmm. people that needed protection weren't there when it was needed. And so, um, you know, out of these tragic situations, like there needs to be a real, real deep dive into how do we make sure that, you know, police are there when we need them to be there, because there are situations when that needs to happen and situations like in Michigan where it didn't need to happen. Right. So where is that accountability? Um, in Buffalo, New York. In Buffalo, New York, there's another one. They knew that this person was plotting to do this. Right. There was a t- if y'all could go and take down a post because somebody said a, a word that you know what I'm saying. Like oh, you, they mm-hmm. can say things. You all could they then they know all these people are planning these things. If you can put someone in Facebook jail for saying something that's like like it's a joke or something, but you, you can't tell me that you didn't see this man plotting and saying these the whole manifesto or whatever he wanted to do weeks and months in advance. So you telling me that you can't pull that information? These you, know, are black Sandra, people. you know what's so funny about your point? Um, I went to call someone an asshole on a post and they said, are you sure you want to say this? Because this could violate our policy. Yes. I put it in Facebook jail. <laughs> you put I put it in Facebook jail because I said you were acting like an ass and I got put in Facebook jail. I did 20 days in jail, y'all. <laughs> oh my God. Facebook jail. They done locked me up because I said you acting like an ass. But you, but this man could plan a whole massacre and and he's not caught. And then they, they patted mm-hmm. him on the back. Like, I'm, listen, <laughs> that's the domestic terrorist. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm going to say. These are domestic terrorists yeah. walking around and, you know, they're feeding him Burger King and they're patting him on the back. I'm still not comfortable going to places because of that. Because mm-hmm. you don't know who's plotting on it. If you see a lot of Black people going somewhere, brown people going somewhere, I, I already feel uncomfortable because you don't know who is wanting to come out and hurt that group of people for what? 
You drove mm-hmm. all the way here and targeted people. You saw a white person. And to have the video, okay, y'all, I'm sorry. I'm about to get real upset <laughs> because these people can be stopped, but we, there's no bill to, to protect black and brown people. But I've seen other bills come, in, come and be signed in the mm-hmm. law. When, when is, okay, I'm going to wait. Don't, don't, don't give me a bill, though. I would just like a little bit more humanity. You know, sometimes I, it makes me so emotional. Like if I see a TikTok, where a, a black kid is being assaulted and a white mother steps in. It makes me so emotional, but I really feel like we need more of that. If we just look at each other as humans, because a bill is going to be yeah. something that we have to depend on later through the court system. But yep. In the moment, someone could stand up for me and say, yo, that's not right. You know, don't mm-hmm. talk to him that way. It, it makes a big, big, big difference. Mm-hmm. Rhonda, on the, on the subject of humanity, I think, and maybe Carol will get into this, but... Um, One of the most upsetting things over the past two years that I've seen is school shooting down um, teaching critical race theory and what that means. Because in my opinion, the only way this is a generational change, everything that we're experiencing right now, like it's not just going to change in a few years. Like it starts with children understanding when they're little babies, like how to be humans, no matter what people look like and and, and, and understanding the experiences that black and brown people have gone through. it, It starts at the education level. Um, and so when I see that ripped apart, um, that breaks my heart because I'm not, I'm not a mother, but I want to be someday. And to understand that like my child, you know, will be around children that don't understand this sort of thing. It makes me, it mm. makes me wonder how are things ever going to change if we're not even teaching, right? Education is the safest place to, to learn and, and grow. This is more vocal about uh, what they plan or, or don't plan to teach in school, but I think it had already started happening anyway. Most of the black history I ever got was from my mom. You know what I yeah. mean? She made me go to the African-American history museums, read books, yeah. and write book reports in the summertime. All of that comes and it starts at home and in black church. So as yeah. long as you keep giving your kids social um, outlets, they can learn and they will learn through you. Um, but it's not even about the black kids. It's about the white kids, really, about them understanding, see, right? Who's taking them to black church? But they have been stopped teaching them anyway. You know, do you remember the governor and the cotton I remember this in Virginia? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, He's crazy. So he, he was in, in, in uh, Black Days. His wife then took the kids to go pick that, right? And I was talking to my girlfriend because she was pissed. And I was like, wait a minute. You know, black people get a different history lesson than us. You know, they are taught that we are indentured servants. I'm not Chandra. I'm just telling you it's the truth. They I know. I, 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 they live it. Told, I live it. I so, live so, it. So, and usually when you tell them, they'd be like, man, for real, that happened. They were unaware. So I have a sensitivity for people who legit did not know. I don't have a sensitivity for ignorance. I can't give you a green but light. We can, cha- we can change that now. We don't have like it can. We can start to teach everyone in this country what what it meant, right? I think I get upset when it's like we now have the opportunity to change this, and we're still fighting against knowledge, mm-hmm. right? See, and, is, and battling that ignorance. It, the thing is, is that I we I was I used I sit on I watch the board meetings here, and I I'm. Because the first thing I ask people is when they're over against critical race theory, define it. Tell me, tell me exactly what it is. Because if you can't tell me exactly what it is, because it's taught on a college level and it's, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, stop, mm-hmm. you know, it's like a buzzword. Let's be, let's be real here. Here in Stafford, I can say that we are not even, I met individuals who are a part of being excluded from schools because of the color. They had one high school for white people, one high school for black people. And these gentlemen, they, they these these five men and one woman, black woman, integrated and they the school got upset. Mind you, I'm meeting these people. These people are still here. You know what I'm saying? This is in this mm-hmm. time, lifetime. So my thing is, is they I feel like those who are against teaching the things that have happened in the past are embarrassed and they don't want to acknowledge the fact that their grandmother that's sitting right now knitting was one of the people that was spitting on children as they were walking into school. And so I think that a lot of times they are, it's like, uh uh-uh, we don't want, Mm. we don't want to be held accountable for our actions of class, like get over it. No, 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 no. Let's, Let's talk about it. Why did you feel it was okay to spit on a child as they were walking in a school? Why did you feel it was okay to make a child feel like they are less than? Why do you feel like you chose and then from the South, why do you feel like you had to, t- a grown man had to say yes, sir, and no, sir, to a child and give that child respect or, and then that child does not respect that person. Like all of these things need to be talked about and needs to be said, because one mm-hmm. thing that is not that they didn't know that people don't know slavery existed, 
but they want to repackage it so that no one, they don't feel bad for the situation. They don't feel empathy for those individuals who went work from sun up to sundown, you know, and did not get paid or their land was stolen from them. Their families were stolen from them. The time from these mothers who, you know, had had children to go and nurse children that grew up to hate them. So this mm-hmm. is the thing, like no one wants, that, that's something that nobody wants to talk about. The wet nurses that nursed these, these same children that grew up to hate the one person that fed them and nourished them. So that's, the, you know, that whole situation, I just, that educational part, you have to talk about. And because mm-hmm. it's so, it's so demeaning and it's so disgusting at times, they don't, no one wants to discuss it because it's, it's, it's embarrassing and it's sick. And they don't, no one wants to be accountable for that. Let me well, say, that, do you think that, I'm sorry, Karen, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You go. My question is, uh, do you think genera- generationally, so if, if my great grandmother was a slave master, not me, but you know, and throughout the years, um, her family has improved. Like she might've, she might've gone to her grave with guilt. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, I, yes. I don't, I don't want you to be, I just, and this is going to sound ridiculous, but I don't want to be so hard hearted to believe that everyone that was acting that way wanted to. Sometimes right. you do what the crowd does. You know what I'm saying? I'm doing right. it because the crowd is doing it. Like, I mean, in, in, in families, I can understand a family not wanting a child to know the history because it would cause the child who was liberated, yep. liberated now to challenge the grandmother. You know you can't challenge your grandmother. I don't no, know what I'm saying. So mm-hmm. some of the stuff I get, I understand, not nationally, but I understand from a familial aspect why some things are not discussed because it would change that child's perception of who their family is. Well, now you're going to deal with an enraged child out on the street that's going to develop some type of mental illness and it could it could come out in a different way. I think that we have opportunities to teach. I think that we can continue to do discussions like this. I think we can open it up to little kids and ask them, mm-hmm. what do you think? You know, what, do you like blue or green? What purple do you think? person do you like? I think it's ways yeah. to break it down uh, in a way that they can, uh, can be palatable. But I think that when you go into some of the harsher stories, I can understand the concerns at times as to why that can't happen. I get it. But I, I do I, feel I, not having the opportunity to make those stories palatable for children. That's yeah. where they want to yeah. nip in the butt. I'm like, you can, you can actually break it down because children, mm-hmm. and, and this is they're resilient and they have more, they feel more than we think they do. Sure. They can tell you if a person has a good heart or not, just sure. in, just mm-hmm. by introducing them. So for them to say, oh, that child be influenced. No, children are well aware and they are more aware than we are. So okay. teaching them and having them, they will, they will, they will get it. They will continue to love without seeing the, you know, the color and all of the, you know what I'm saying? That they will, they will be able to love. Like, I know this person is different, but I still love them. They are just yeah. like me. They bleed just like me. Like, I think it's having empathy, not shame, right? Like we shouldn't shame yes. a child for their background. It's not that their fault sure. that their grandfather was a shithead, mm-hmm. whatever. Like, right, right. you know, like it's right. not the kid's fault, but like well, just well, to, 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 to feel right as a human that that was really wrong the way a group of people have been right. treated. And I want to have understanding for this is the way things are now and be and sympathize with that and, and right. help this group. That, that's what I kind of mean, right? Like to just whitewash over it and pretend like it never yeah. happened. Then you look at a group of people and say, like, why are most low income people, black and brown people like, are they just dumb? Mm -hmm. You know, like there's a reason why a group of people has been Mm -hmm. oppressed for so long. And like, let's understand those reasons so we can work to change it. You know, And I think one interesting point, I was just in Brazil recently and I did not know much about Brazilian history. Um, Slave slave culture was huge there, obviously. It didn't end until like 1880 something. And, And one of our tour guides, this is a little bit of qualitative story, but he was a uh, mixed race like me. And we were talking about racism um, in Brazil and racism in America. And he was like, yeah, I mean, it's not good here. But like, you know, one of my friends went to America and oh my God, he could barely walk down the street. I think he went, I think he said he went somewhere in the South. So um, <laughs> that might play into it as well. But it was just really interesting to hear someone from a totally different country. Our tour guide had never been to America and just the stories that come to him about racism in America when he's living in a country that is also heavily racist. Like the favelas are people that are either of you know African descent or mixed race, not that not the European Portuguese looking people. So mm-hmm. it was just it was really interesting to, to hear the and same learn. Thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think we have a great example when we look at what Germany did after World War II. 
mm-hmm. and how they just were like, nope, we, we have to talk about it. Whether they wanted to or not, we have to talk right. about it. And there's a, in Nuremberg where I live, there's the documentation center. And you hear stories of grandparents talking about like, like you mentioned, Rhonda, like either I, I did or I didn't know what was going on, or I, I didn't realize what was happening or the shame they feel and the guilt. And there's something on the human level about showing that people can be good and bad at the same time and people can change and people can learn. And like when we don't talk about the complexity of, of human nature and what, why people made the choices they did at that time, whether they were good or bad, or if they've changed or not, we don't give anyone space to uh, evolve themselves. And I think because we're not having this conversation at a bigger level, everyone's getting put into the, you were bad or you were good camp. And it's not, there's no freedom in that for people to talk about it. But one thing that really scares me about statistics that are coming out is, and this actually, a piece of this came out from the the January 6th committee conversations, is that um, the rise in groups that are in conversation about the replacement theory that's happening so that like white people are being replaced in America, which is a complete, like it's nonsense. And <laughs> it's, it, it's just hard to address. I, I was in the mountain film festival in Telluride and we had a whole discussion about like, is document is, um, uh, democracy dying and, and what's happening. And it was, they were talking about the rise of proud boys, the rise of other groups that are popping up and, they did a whole study recently about in New England, how fast it's growing at a scary level, which is where I think it's like, I'm like, how can this be happening? Like it's in the Northeast. There's so many universities, um, but so much of it does tie back to where people are getting their information or where they're not. Um, okay. Go Wait. for it. Go. I don't mean to laugh. I got to understand. Yeah. I'm, I'm one of these people like, some of the thought processes are so ridiculous. You have to laugh and then, one of the yes. leaders of the Proud Boys is of mixed race. Yes. And I'm like, yes. sir, are you shooting half of you? Like, what, what? how are you, how are you compartmentalizing who you hate in yourself? Because it makes no sense. But the whole replace, like, who is coming up? Like, are they rolling the dice? Like, let's figure out how we're going to do this. Let's roll the dice and figure something stupid out today. Like, to me, it's, it's mind boggling mm-hmm. of the theories that come out and, all of these things, I'm like, who, like, they're taking our jobs. Who, who, who is they? Yeah. Define yeah. they and what, what jobs did they take from you? Did you apply? Right. <laughs> are you qualified? So these are the things that make me, and it's probably why I don't um, have the discussions with some of these people, because you're not going to get through, because it's, it's, I don't know. I just, yeah. I just, I, I don't know. I, and they call themselves the Proud Boys. Proud of what? It's on. Uh, it's such it's such a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous theory, though, because you have mm-hmm. people who are not well, like the Buffalo shooter, because I'm pretty sure he was the believer in replacement theory, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. um, that was part of his manifesto. Exactly. So it's like, it is incredibly dangerous that it's pervading right now, because that is something that many, many like sick individuals will, will, I mean, do exactly what just happened, right? So yep. um, it's, but like what you said, Chandra, like, who are you replacing? Did you apply for that job? Like, it's just, it is this fear mongering and this othering yeah. that is just like, it's, it's incredibly dangerous. Because what? It, it's not rooted in reality. It's rooted in, oh my gosh, something is being taken away from me. What is being taken away? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, like, ex- explain that to me. Like, what are you, what are you losing? And that's the whole mindset. And it's not, I'm not saying that it's upper class individuals it's more of like it's that mindset of poor poor lower income individuals who have that mindset like mind you th- this party is not for you they're not looking out for your health care they're looking out for you mm-hmm. but you're doing the work that they that 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 you know you just uh, Wait, this is historical right i mean this goes back to like slave days right like it lower is. income white people who are essentially like you know they weren't they weren't boat. owned by anyone but they were basically in the same boat or like when mm-hmm. slavery slavery was over and you have the great migration and you know different ethnic groups moving to big cities and getting jobs and um you know it's it's this is like 
tales old as time in a way, but it's much more dangerous now with social media and Facebook groups and Reddit groups and whatever it is. Well, there, there's also the rise in um, uh, anti-Semitic conversations and groups. Like there's just a, a rise in hating everyone right now, which yeah, um, it, like it's all baffling to me. The only good piece of news I got out of this discussion we had about is democracy dying is that the guy who was embedded with some of these groups said that they all hate each other so much that they can't really like organize enough to like do anything of like political significance <laughs> so far. Um, he's like, it's like going to a high school kind of drama like scenario where like who's dating who and they hate each other. And like, there's so much um, inter fighting and com- competition that that was like the light he saw at the end of this tunnel. Um, but like, it's, it's, I, I think it ties back to kind of what you mentioned earlier, Rhonda, of there are, all, there are these people who think they should have something and because they don't, and because of the, what's happening with the, the income disparity right now, that people who aren't getting what they think they should have access to or thought where they should be or mm. fill it in, they're like, it must be your fault because you took my spot. And I'm like, we have ha- we have how many jobs open right now that we can't fill in America? But like no, no this goes back. Work. Yeah, this goes back to accountability. Though, like someone's got to play the blame game, right? For whoever happy yep. someone like it. So when it comes to like you know some low income white men, I'll just say because that's per- the most pervasive. Um, who's easy to blame, right? Who can mm-hmm. be the scapegoat instead of saying, "Look, maybe I should. I need to turn around on my own life," right? Maybe I need um, to admit that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It, they're never wrong, so. Yeah. I, I, well, I do. <laughs> well, so sorry, much yeah. of this we know, like, w- we can, we have lots of power. Should we choose to use it, right? And so much of this does come down to to voting and voter registration and being active in that. We've had a bunch of primaries happening right now and the trends everywhere that 16% of eligible voters did anything about it. Um, have you yeah. guys watched The G Word on Netflix? No. Not yet. I highly recommend it. It's, it's a, a, it's a, a, President Obama was an executive producer on it, but a comedian's running it. And they're looking at the things that, the surprising things the government does do good for us and all the things that are a hot mess. Like they do the entire weather system, but then FEMA's a shit show, right? Like, so they kind of do this contrast. But Part of the takeaway was how important the local government is. And that's where a lot of um, the Make America Great efforts were being pushed, like under the radar, was at local, local levels more than what we do see. So I'm going to open up to you guys. Uh, What are you seeing at a local level? How... Like, what actions are you seeing people taking or do you encourage others to take? And I know this is a hot topic for you, Chandra. Yes, because I've, uh, like, I've been doing voter, I've been pushing for voter registration now because we do have the Republican primary that's coming up and on the 21st. And um, if you see the ads, like, it's so low key because, like, right now, like, only the, it's the Republican primary. So, Basically, everybody's jockeying to see, you know, trying to get the Senate seats and, you know, figure out who's going to be on the ballot in November. But the problem is, is that no one's really paying attention to what they're saying and what their missions are. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you never like I I actually I was at a school board meeting and one of the um, one of the candidates was was trying to go. Like she knew that was her audience at the school Mm -hmm. board. And they, you know, someone came in with, um, um, I'm not sheep. And, it, you know, and it wasn't a sheep on the um, thing. It was a ram. I was like, you in the right place. You need to learn. But it was like, yo, you know, the school is not raising my kids. And so she pandered to them. Like she was in love with it because those were her people because she could actually, you know, get them to come vote for her because, and that's the most, it's like some of the disgusting things I'm seeing here in Stafford with the, with this primary and no one's really calling it out. No one's really saying anything because it's quiet because, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of times we don't, you know, they don't address it, but it's very low key. And for me, I'm trying to get the information out 
so that everybody knows, listen, y'all, this is who the Democratic person is going to be up against. You need to know who you're mm-hmm. going, you know, who your neighbor is really supporting, who you're, who everyone's supporting, who at the Board of Supervisors is supporting, who on the school board is supporting, because you need to know who you're up against come November. But mm-hmm. it's like, um, they don't realize, like, oh, it's June, nobody has to vote. Get your behinds to the ballot. Even if you're a Republican, you know, make sure that person aligns with your views because they could be a super radical. Even with the Democrats, there could be someone who is not in giving you your best interest. And here Mm -hmm. you can change your party. You could be a Republican and run as a Democrat. Mm -hmm. And you know what I'm saying? So essentially you can actually do that. You know, switch, go to the Democratic, uh, the the Democratic caucus and get put on, be put on their ballot. And it's like, yo, pay attention. This mm-hmm. can happen. The bait and switch can happen. So be aware of what is going on. And it's like, I, I, I... The first thing I'd like to say is that I am, I'm a good Republican. It's embarrassing these days. You just gonna say that on record. I am a good Republican. <laughs> I'm not a bad one. I know Trump gave us a bad name. I want to really, I think I've been more in line with Republican views for a long time because I make money. And so when you make mm-hmm. money, you want to make sure your money goes somewhere. That's all. I don't want to be yeah. taking care of everybody's kids because they don't. I want to have social services to actually work a person socially. I don't want you to be burdened with social services for the rest of your life or mine. That's just, that's my idea. Okay. That's the first thing I'd like to say. Mm-hmm. Second thing I'd like to say is everything Chandra is saying is true. However, I think people like me are tired. I Mm -hmm. have not watched the news in months and it's so much against me because I love political science. I love to watch CNN. I even watch Fox. I watch any news at all. I haven't watched Mm -hmm. nothing because it has been so emotionally draining. I will go on record saying that I um, did vote for Joe Biden and I am utterly disappointed. You know what I mean? But I think a lot of people that look like me are also disappointed and they're going to be more inclined to do research this time. I think Joe mm-hmm. Biden kind of was dangled in front of us like a carrot. He had a Kamala. So we were like, oh, why are he down? He had yeah. Bi- <laughs> Bi- 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 I'm still looking for Kamala. No, but listen, and I think the, the, <laughs> the time I got the most disgusted with him was when I yeah. saw the pictures at the border with Haitians. I could not take it. And the fact that he never came out and made a political statement about that. No, and that's the babies which I don't like. Don't yeah, tell you somebody everybody human rights and you do something like that. That's crazy to me. So mm-hmm. I, I think that it, it, one or two things are going to happen. Either you're going to have a lot of people that vote counter to what they ever voted before. Or you're going to have a lot of people that just stay home because they don't give a shit anymore. It is great. Yep. We've been in an, uh, an emotional political cycle for at least eight years. It's tiring. Yep. You cannot keep, you can't keep doing right. this or having an expectation. I also think one like w- the political system is now de- is now defined on either party by the most radical on each party, yeah. right? Like that, yep. defi- like Republican, like you know, um, ideologies are not they're not bad ideologies. Neither you know on the other side of things, like are Democrats, but it's like you're defined by either Mason Cawthorn or whatever, who's like filmed humping people. I don't even know what his deal is, or you know, on the on the other side of things, like the, like. That is clickbaity. And I have to like, I have mm-hmm. to say, like, like, while social media can do so much good because you can like find out about different rallies or networkings or whatever it is to like support local candidates. On the flip side, I feel like we all tra- are now trained to have these like clickbaity candidates in a way. And that's mm-hmm. who defines the parties. And it's become so polarized, right? Like, or Rhonda, you're like, okay, I'm just going to come out and say it. Like, I'm a Republican and like people are going to roast me, whatever. But it shouldn't be a bad thing. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't yeah. have to be, be a bad thing, but unfortunately, like in the world that we live in and in the social media landscape we live in, like the people that get the attention that define the parties. And I guess, you know, someone like Trump, like he, he was or is or whatever as a social media superstar, like he galvanized an audience, right? Like he's the most clickbaity and he yeah. like leads the party now because he has the most, like he, he's the most popular in that party, right? But like Trump's his popularity has increased since Biden. People like yeah. him more. I'm in, I'm in, I have barbecues here all the time. They like, yo, so we're going to vote for Trump or what? Okay. Now, <laughs> years ago, we could have never said that. You know what I mean? My yeah. mother would have yeah. me out the house if I even considered it. But this political cycle has been so disappointing with the inflation, mm-hmm. with the war yeah. in Russia and this gas. It's just too much for people to really get a hold on, even though I don't feel like any one single candidate is to blame. And I think most people yeah. agree with that. The lack of planning, the lack of execution 
You just need some. I need an adult. Whatever adult yeah. fits the role, sign up. Kara, you should run. I would vote for I'm going to say this. Be pretty balanced. So I'm going to say this. We have six Republicans running to be on the ballot for our House of Representatives here in Virginia, in uh, my county. Mm-hmm. We only have one, one um, Democrat. She's already she's going to be she's going to be on the ballot um, come November, right? We have one seating sitting Republican who's been no one's ran, people have run against him. He's been here. He's going to stay here. I think he's going to die in office. And the thing is, though, because of how. <sighs> I'm not mad at you, Ronda, because my father was a Reagan Republican. And he said he, he said that. He goes, there's a difference. You know what I'm saying? God rest his soul. But my one thing my dad said, come, going forward, the party has been dil- d- diluted and, and poisoned by the inflammatory things. And that's when he, he said this. Before, like he's, My dad passed away in 2013. But he said that back then. He goes, watch what happens. Watch what's mm-hmm. going to be the thing that, you know, the Republican Party is going to be split. And it's split now. Because you have those who are against Trump and those who yeah. had the, the true Republican values of, listen, you know, we need to, you know, we, you know, we're not going to take care of people's children. You know, you know those, they're like Rhonda said, but then you have the ones who are using the, um, they're using fear mongering to push their agenda that is, that's um, pro-white male. That's all, that, that's to be real, pro-white male and pro-rich mm-hmm. white male. So there's no, there, there's no, um, there's no no room from anybody else, and the women and, and it's like, um, it blows my mind that mm-hmm. individuals are not seeing, you know, because I'm I'm I mean, the administrator current administration now it like you know for them for what they did to hate like that bothered me because you come out and you say something about Ukraine and Russia, but you don't say anything about what was going on with these brown people though, and that, that I, you know you take note and I'm like, um, the vice president could have spoke on it, but. but I'm, I'm still, I'm still looking for the statement. I haven't heard her speak on nothing. Have, have you heard her speak at all? That's what I'm saying. I don't no, even know. Okay. Is she still there? No. I feel like they're, I mean, they're trying to distance her from this train wreck a bit, I think, is what they're trying to do. Oh, so because she's going to run? And being she, asked is two different well, things. I, you, yeah, 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 no, I understand that's her role, but, like, I think that, like, they're, they're politically, like, taking her away because, Come the next election cycle, like I don't know what the deal, what their plan is, but like I don't think they want her tied next to Biden's hand in hand, yeah. um, given the current trajectory. That's why it's not it's not a good thing. It's just that's what that's why I, I kind of think she has. Well, been around. I I just I just feel like in in the grand scheme of things, we 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 kind of got bad boots. <laughs> yeah. um, they placated because they you know they we we you know we we were happy to have a woman as the vice president, but a woman of color. But like, that's that placation I've been talking about. Like, let me just get, yeah. here y'all go. <laughs> Be happy. <laughs> there you go. Now don't talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I was very, very excited, but um, it was underwhelming to say the least. So I'm gonna leave it at that because I don't want to, I, I, I have to be mindful. Yes, because. Uh, well, I, I just think, you know. Nobody could get us. Rhonda, you said, I just want someone to be an adult. I just want someone to have a set of balls. Like, please just say what you know is the right thing versus continuing to care about where the party funding is coming from or who the party head is or any of this stuff because, you know, yes. yep, go ahead, please. Just like, so just, you know, um, we, we are a nation steeped in history and traditionalism. I just wonder if we just, Cut out all the the BS and start yeah. it over. You know what I mean? Maybe <laughs> the uh, the Bill of Rights needs to be rewritten. You know, it that, it no longer fits. You know, you're not dealing with. You know, I, I don't even know. I mean, you have to go back and do a research to see how many people were really living in the days when everyone was given permission to carry a gun. We it's millions of people now. It's just not safe. You know, um, maybe those things need to be rewritten and redone. I don't. We don't live there. Other countries have their own issues, but this amount of bickery, it can't even be safe. It's not even normal. We are are arguing about the dumbest things. Kids should not get shot, period. That's a period. Kids should not get shot. People in church should not get shot. If I go to the grocery store, I should not get shot. What are we arguing about? And that's exactly Mm -hmm. what McConaughey was saying. We are divided on this. We agree. If the NRA didn't exist, we would not have this problem. They pay so many and we can't compete Mm -hmm. with that. We can, I think, locally work on um, what our agenda is going to be. I don't mm-hmm. think 
I depend on the national government uh, for nope. that type of guidance. For me, it takes so much time for it to go through. That, you know, yes. it has to start in your backyard. And a lot of yeah. times mm-hmm. I say, you know, um, they didn't buy those guns federally, nationally. Like, they bought them on account. And like, yes, those I, rules on how to yeah. buy, to, mm-hmm. the rules on buying guns. Like, I can go right now down to Prince William County, Virginia, right? And for me to buy one of those, because you can go to the um, the gun show, right? There's a limit, and there you have to fill out paperwork and wait and come back to the market to the to the gun show mm-hmm. to get what you're purchasing. But then again, they still do uh, a NAC check. I mean, a local um, a local check, criminal check. And if you show up on local as being a, a domestic violence offender, you know, like that starts at a at a local level. So we can't say there needs to be a national rule. No, no, no. These local yeah. officials need to put the squash on that. But Chandra, they didn't even have a national rule for COVID. How they didn't do that? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you let every state make their own decision about COVID, and you don't let them make their own decisions on that. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I can't agree. So there, that's all. No, my favorite I thing I heard like, recently. I just feel like it has to start somewhere because if you know the national, it has to come out nationally. That's true. But until that happens, these local. And these local governments yeah. have to do have to do their part because it starts in your backyard. And if the local, the federal government's not going to do it, then the local government needs to set their foot down and do things that the federal government is not going to do. Mm-hmm. Because that's like having a parent and then a step parent. No, the parent got to set the rule down, and the step parents going to have to follow suit. Because at the end of the day, if you like, you can't take a gun across state lines here, like from DC, from Virginia to DC, you will go to jail. You know what I'm saying? If you're caught. So that, yes. And it's a thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you're caught. But the whole process is, you know, making sure these rules are in place and enforced. You know, like they're like if I have to fill out this three page, four page document to buy a gun. Right. They shouldn't be selling them online. You know what I'm saying? If they're sold online, you have to do the same thing. I just feel like this local level, it starts there because it would help. You know, it would help push federal because keep in mind the people who are making the laws in the federal, in the government, in, the, in Washington are the same ones who are here in our county. These are the people we elected to speak for us in, in federally. So if we don't get the person to here to go speak for us in Washington, then you're stuck. Then the law is not going to take place and you have to make hold these people accountable. You got my vote. Now you're going to do what I say. So that- my, my favorite gun uh, story I heard recently is that I don't remember what country it is. Um, but they were saying that for a man to get a gun, he has to get a letter signed by every woman he's ever dated, ever been oh, married to, this. his sisters, and their, his mother. And I I'm like, like we should just implement that now. They ain't nobody going to have a gun. They will lie. 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 <laughs> well, and, and what people don't talk about with the gun violence in particular, the, the statistic that has stuck with me that I find so horrifying is that every 14 minutes, a woman is shot and killed by her partner in America. Wow. Every 14 minutes. How many well, women have died just since we've been talking because of gun violence in the U.S.? Because the, the, the red um, flag laws aren't in place everywhere. Because if you're if you've been committed of domestic abuse or have a um, what's it called against you a restraining order like that like there's were no one thinks that those people should have access to weapons no one does so like we have to just stop this nonsense that's going around and I think that you know the reason I love talking to you, all of you is because you are such smart women, right? Like when we really start talking to each other, it is, but like it's when we talk to each other, we're like, yeah. So everyone should be listening to us. Like why, you know, it just speaks to the fact of like, okay, like when, when do we get to let every per, like, person, if we're going to use social media, let's just do a vote. Everyone in the U S go online and press yes or no. We would get things done faster because like the percentages of agreement on these big topics is ridiculous. The only people who don't seem to agree are the people in Congress and Senate. And it's like, what and is most going of us on? have been there for too long anyway. Like, why do you have a walk or get into your seat, um, people? Like, yeah. get out and let somebody else come and make decisions because you're falling asleep. You, you, you don't know what's really going on. Let's get some people in there that really know what they're doing. And then, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, but also, I, like, also, most of them know what's what's right or wrong. If, if that trumps their political agenda, right, where they're getting mm-hmm. funding, right, most of them know what to do. It's if they actually will do it. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's what I think. You know, Liz Cheney saying last night, "This is not about who's the leader right now. It's your conscience and your constitution. Yeah, what are you going to do exactly. about it?" And I'm like, okay, like those. No, that that money when, is 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 on their shoulder though. Remember, remember that. when um the guy <laughs> he was a senator, I think he got shot at the baseball stadium. Remember they were mm-hmm. playing baseball. I was like, this is it. This is the moment they want to do nope. something. Nope. Oh, or Ga- or Gabby and Gifford. Gabby Gifford. Gabby Gifford. It was crazy. Yeah. Well. You should dodge the bullet. That's what they're gonna say. But you shouldn't have been there. Okay, <laughs> it's the craziest thing. I don't get it. I don't. I don't understand politics. Is just, I'm, I'm sorry. If like y'all to... look at the, the money, if you follow the money, yeah. that'll tell you exactly where it's gonna go. Because I'm gonna tell you, them them political packs are are powerful. You know, like mm-hmm. look at what happened with the with the airlines and lifting the mask uh, requirements at, on airplanes. You think that this that happened because that money? Like, listen, I'm gonna cut off your money if you don't you don't get it together. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, you gotta look at follow the dollars. You'll follow what's gonna happen next. I, mean, I would just like to say that DeSantis today announced that he wants CPS to pro parents taking kids to drag shows. This is what's important. Oh yeah, I've seen a ton of that the other day. Yeah. Wait, wait a minute now. Wait, 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 wait yeah. a minute now. Um, Whole different racism though. Um, you know what I'm saying? Because yes. Oh, they, but this is the same person that don't want to get the world. This is the same person. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my governor. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody needs to go tap him on the shoulder and ask him who who did who who hurt you? It's so you crazy. Go to world I mean, world. his wife has his wife is um I think she's a survivor. This one his wife is a breast cancer survivor. He's got kids. It's the strangest thing. He takes these harsh mm-hmm. stances. Um, what's the other one? Oh, Texas. Don't say Texas. Cruz, Greg yeah. Abbott, Abbott, Greg and, Abbott. And, and Cruz, uh, Ted Cruz, when he went and he did the mm-hmm. speech right after the kids got killed, I was so proud of that man that stood up to him in the restaurant and said, "Why would you do this? This is not the time. These kids just died. You can't vouch for guns mm-hmm. right now. It's insensitive. And these people have kids. They don't care. Yeah. Even when it's at their back door, they'll find a way to excuse it and not make a move. So, well, and, and they completely. So, there's been such a shift since the early '80s in like who's who's um commandeered different mm-hmm. values in America. You know, there's mm-hmm. all these articles, if you look for them right now, of, of evangelical or Christian church leaders who are being kicked out because they aren't getting in line with the MAGA approach. And they're, and they're having it fired or they're, or they're resigning. There are, um, you know, the Second Amendment, how they strategically have been twisting what the Second Amendment actually stands for and mm-hmm. making it this thing where like what people say the second amendment is isn't actually what's written down mm-hmm. like it is mm-hmm. so different from that and <laughs> i mean even but, yeah but like even even the the <laughs> first party to to support a dream act was the republican party yep like there's there's so there's been such a shift in the 80s and 90s of uh, to, to today of what talking points are used and how they've been rescripted to the point where it is just a bunch of like Retro. I don't know. It, it, it's, old, go ahead. Older black men were they were Republicans. All the old, yeah. older yep. men in my family that were business yep. owners, especially they were Republicans. Republicans were part yep. of the people. We were the, the party of um, Lincoln. So yep. uh, Abraham, but in the party of Lincoln. <laughs> so it's just it's so interesting to me, even even through social media, how. We in our own, and this is why it's so interesting for me to have conversations on race because I experience black on black racism every day. We won't have to get into that today. But um, how we, we, that's why it's embarrassing to say, oh, I'm a Republican to certain people because they will attack you based off of the limited knowledge they have on even what it means to be a Democrat. A lot of stuff that people recite is, um, you know, third party. They got it from someone else. It's like the Bible. When I used to go to my church when I was growing up, they would say, go to the Bible for yourself. And you had to read all the scriptures. People don't do that anymore. They hear your scripture, yeah. they repeat it like they know everything. Wait. They're not making decisions on their own. Social media is like the worst place to get your information, right? Because mm-hmm. I've seen one quote be a, a, attributed to, to 17 different people. Like, so y'all just gonna take this and put this on people like, listen, this don't even go together. Like, 
I, mm-hmm. I just feel like the the way that information is is disseminated now at the at the rate that it is, even if it's misinformation, it mm-hmm. spreads like wildfire. And I feel like social media is giving a voice to the most the people who should shut up. Like yeah. I don't like. Well said. I don't want to talk. To them. <laughs> I don't know what they identify as smart or stupid, but I'm just saying. It's giving yeah. a voice to people who just, just turn turn the turn the volume all the way down. Don't say nothing else. Because it's that's that kind of that's how the information is spread. That's that. Yeah. Like something is so dumb that it get mind boggles, but it's passed and people are saying go deeper. On TikTok. Go deeper. Go deeper. Because even with what you're saying, mm-hmm. we all recognize that it's dumb, but that dumb thing will have 1.5 million views. It exactly. is the metaverse. They are controlling everything. The more ridiculous it sounds, the more it's promoted. I can say mm-hmm. something completely reasonable about credit. It gets five views. Someone says something like, don't pay your bills. You don't got to do that. Three million. Yeah, well, yours is what? muted. <laughs> so yours is yeah. muted. It's it, muted because it makes sense. It's right, exactly. Sense. Shadow ban, correct. Like I so, tell people, it's shadow ban. And like both of you and my client are shadow ban. Why? Mm-hmm, because y'all mm-hmm. making sense. Okay, mm-hmm, you're mm-hmm. not saying to do sure. people to, oh, go get this CCN number and then you right, get right. your LLC and then you can buy all the land. I'm like, where are y'all getting this stuff from? So y'all focus. Just, okay. Focus. Just, yeah, but <laughs> social media yeah. and that, that whole Cambridge Analytica thing, when I watched that on yeah. Netflix a few years ago, my eyes were open, open. And then I started mm-hmm. applying it to credit. And I was exper- ex- uh, expressing to people how all those algorithms play together. We already know what you're going to do. That's how they yeah. determine how they're going to lend to you. All of that is connected. So, yeah. I just, this, this, this was a what? great conversation. That's all I'm going to say. Cause Good. I, I, I can't say this online because I'll be in Facebook jail again. So that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I ain't trying to be in Facebook. Cause I'm going to happen is. Dumb. Yeah. Cause I really You're... want to comment. Are y'all dumb? Like, <laughs> did y'all not read? But here's a link to the book. Like, I, I'm tired. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I just appreciate that now you guys are going to get me in Facebook jail and that's okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll go to jail for you guys. Um, I mean, I'm free now. <laughs> um, but so I want to end this on some optimism because that's, well, I got to have hope, right? We got to keep pushing forward. Yep. So I would love you guys to tell me what are, you know, one thing or three things that you are, would recommend people to do. You're happy you see his progress. Like, what are you, what are you hopeful about and how can people participate in hope right now mm. <laughs> the, your face to that question was amazing it said a lot for everyone it said there's some serious skeptical hippo eyes right there about like i don't think you, there's any hope left in the world <laughs> we, we, we just hoping and praying right now that's all we do we're yet praying <laughs> it's on the we 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 on hold for Jesus. That's all. I can. Yeah, it's, it's, this is just an interesting little world. I think everyone honestly should go to therapy because it is a lot to take in on a daily basis. I can't. Yeah. What am I hopeful about? I'm still hopeful about minority home ownership. I am hopeful that this will be what they can use as a catalyst to break uh, genera- generational wealth curses with people experiencing rapid um, home equity like this. I'm only. I'm just hopeful that they use it in the right way. You know, mm-hmm. so that's what I'm hopeful about. Yeah. I'm just hopeful more individuals start looking at the makeup of their local and their state, their local county and state level um, politics and the inv- individuals who are making the decision for them. I really I'm hopeful that more people would actually take the moment and actually have a heart and not be so, you know, just so so blinded to seeing other people are hurting and i'm not mm-hmm. asking them to give the shirt off their back but i'm asking them to lift one lift each other up you know not you know not looking at oh you got something that i don't have so i can't help you no 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 no. just have a heart and you know look out for each other and that's all i i don't i'm hopeful that more people will actually start speaking the truth and when and not say that somebody's hating or bashing when they're speaking mm-hmm. the truth and not doing the bandwagon thing. That's that, mm-hmm. that's all I got because I'm on the block list for heaven because I don't pray too much. I don't I don't worry the Lord so much. He tired. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm hopeful that people. I, I think we were here for a bit and then it's kind of squandered a little bit. The people kind of projecting at people. Let let's start mm-hmm. listening again. 
and let's start empathizing and then taking action to support. Um, and I say that just because I think in the in the in the world that I live in, in terms of trying to to raise money and such, it's like the only way people like me get forward is if other people lend out a helping hand and mm-hmm. actually make that introduction or invite me to that event and 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 vice versa. I remember a few weeks ago, this one girl was having a really bad day and asked a question at a panel, and this VC was so rude to her. I pinged her on the side and I was like, I think I might have an investor for you to meet with. And she got a meeting with this investor and she was like, Thank you so much for actually doing what you said you were going to do, right? How many people say mm-hmm. they're going to help or make this intro or, you know, lend a helping hand, whatever it is, and don't do it. So taking like listening, empathizing and taking action, even the smallest of things can, can change someone's life. Mm-hmm. So um, I think support, support in any yeah. way you can at any level. Okay. Well, and we all know that if, if 25 people, a hundred people were on a cruise ship, we'd figure it out. We'd figure it out. We would, we would never say you don't get any food or you don't get yeah. access. We talk about the Titanic right now. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a difference? Is there a difference? Um, but so I just, it, it baffles me when we get so to your, like all of you have mentioned, like just being human, right? Being kind. Like what's, what, what would a five-year-old do in this situation, right? Most of the time a, a five-year-old is going to want to make sure everyone's okay. And yeah. there's, there's this gap of like, are you okay? Am I okay? Okay. Who's not okay here? Cause we got to fix who's not okay. Cause it, you know, I think we forget that there's a weakest link element. I think we forget how much everyone's going through all the time. So, um, yeah, I'm on team with be more human and, you know, give, giving grace so we can get it back. Cause I know I'm going to need some. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as always, guys, I love getting to have these powerful conversations with you. Thank you for being a guest to me and the powerful ladies and each other in this community. Um, it does make me feel more hopeful because you guys exist in the world and you're just living every day as the good humans that you're asking everyone else to be. So thank you for that. You are most welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you. I love being on the panel with, <laughs> with these ladies. Like, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm working on being more yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I'm <gonna be> <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you guys have? We're going to do a quick shout outs and wrap it up. So what do you guys have going on? How can people support you, follow you? Where can they find you? Lauren, you can start. I'll, I'll step in. Um, please, if you love fashion and pretty clothes, go to Dora Mar. I'm going to type the website in here because that's my baby. Um, and you can follow us at Shop Dora Mar. And you'll see me tagged all over that. So you can find me too. My handle looks like it Wilson, but it's LT Wilson. (laughs) Perfect. Rhonda. Oh, I am relaunching my nonprofit on Juneteenth. My nonprofit is uh, created to help minorities buy homes. I'm hoping to start an initiative called Get On The Bus, where we get on buses with lenders, realtors, and community leaders um, in Baltimore, Baltimore has a lot of money to give. So we've bought $20,000 in different areas in grant money. So I'm going to take the buses there. People walk through, lose their fear of the city, and get welcome back in to Baltimore. Love I'm be that. I'm going to hit you up because, you know, I love Baltimore's my other home. Okay, um, cool. <clears throat> yes. <yeah>, so <laughs> I um, currently, I'm going to, I'm doing a relaunch at the beginning of July of my, it's a membership program because uh, people like to pick my brain. And you can't pick my brain for free because my brain is my is is it's how it's going to help you. And so mm-hmm. I um I'm relaunching that. So go to ChandraGoreConsulting.com, get on the mailing list so that you can get access to that. Also follow Conversations with Chan. We're gearing up to release a whole bunch of episodes with some amazing amazing guests. I do have a um a special podcast series with Pretty Women Hustle magazine. And so I can't wait for that to come out. And that's what I have going on. I have amazing clients. Check them out. I can't shout them all out because this is right now. So <laughs> I, I, that's all I have. And I'm getting better at telling what I have on. But thank you, Kara, for this amazing panel again. I can't believe it's been two years. I know. I can't handle <laughs> it. I know. Well, again, you guys are amazing. Thank you for being incredible humans and we will continue this conversation. Thank you for listening to this special episode of the Powerful Ladies Podcast. We will continue to host the Powerful Conversations About America series. 
because powerful ladies are about change. Powerful ladies are the ones out there doing the work and whose opinions we need to be highlighting and sharing along with their personal experiences. For additional resources and ways to take action, follow us on Instagram at Powerful Ladies. You can follow and connect with our panelists on Instagram, Rhonda Brunson at msbrunson underscore credit queen, Chandra Gore at C Gore Consults, Lauren Wilson at LT Wilson and at Shop Dora Mar. You can find me on Instagram at Kara underscore Duffy. In the meantime, we'll see you next week for a brand new episode of the Powerful Ladies podcast with an amazing new guest. In the meantime, be safe, be loud, be the leaders we need, be awesome and up to something you love.